Good afternoon to this um, first session in the afternoon. Uh, it's uh, labeled education and later life outcomes. And I want to straight away put your expectations right. Um, this is through the eyes of a kid, later life outcomes. So for some of us, later life may sound a bit stretched. Um, <laughs> it's actually beyond primary into secondary teenage years and adulthood, right? And so we've got uh, three papers. It's a little bit in the tradition of what Stephen presented uh, the last paper in the previous session, uh, to look at treatment effects and um, what are the long-term impacts of that. Uh, that, that kind of tradition. Uh, some of it using uh, uh, survey data. So the first paper is presented by Ricardo, uh, looks at Uganda. And it examines the effects of a literacy intervention uh, in lower primary and looking then examining whether that has impacts five years later. Second paper is by Jennifer, is using Young Lives data, which we've seen before. This one looks at Ethiopia and Peru and uh, studies the relationship between skills at age 12 and educational outcomes at age 15 and 19 and 20, right? And then the third paper, so we, we go progressively into adulthood. The third paper looks at Bangladesh, is by Rubaya, and studies the relationship between educational attainment and voting behavior as an adult. So, Ricardo, you have the floor. Thank you. So um, I'm presenting here a paper on the uh, Northern Uganda literacy program uh, with, uh, uh, I wrote with uh, Julie uh, Bull Wilkes, who is here, and also Jason Kerwin, Jeffrey Smith, and Rebecca Thornton. So just a little bit of context for the uh, Ugandan uh, primary education system. This comprises grades one through seven, and uh, the official policy is that grades one through third year should be a uh, uh, focus on learning to read in particularly in the mother tongue. And Uganda has uh, around 40 uh, different native languages in three different language families. Uh, uh, then fourth grade should be a transition year and then uh, starting grade five, they should uh, focus to uh, learn to read in English. Um, so the implementation of this, of this uh, policy has been difficult. Not every uh, school is compliant. Several schools start teaching how to read directly in English or start uh, a lot earlier than grade four. Uh, and there's been like, there's uh, little support, although education should be free, uh, primary education should be free. A lot of schools actually request some money in, in a way like a donation, but if, if the students don't, uh, or the parents of the students don't give these donations, they're sent back home. So, uh, uh, the, 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 and obviously schools do this because they are underfunded. Uh, and also some uh, socioeconomic context, these are extremely poor uh, uh, families. They, they have poor health conditions uh, and social indicators. Uh, and it, this should not surprise us that uh, learning outcomes are also very poor. Uh, uh, by grade two, 88% of uh, children can read a single word. So the program, which is uh, in Northern Uganda, like I said, and was developed by the uh, ONG Mango Tree in, in um, Uganda, focuses on grades one through three. Uh, and it's specified on introducing uh, students to reading, particularly in their mother tongue. So they try to make grades one, two, and three exclusively in their, in their mother tongue. And uh, uh, they introduce concepts much slower than, than the uh, regular version or the regular curriculum. Uh, uh, so they, uh, there are several components to this uh, program. The first one is uh, this different or revised curriculum. Uh, uh, and this program was implemented in two versions, uh, thinking that this could, uh, that the first version that Mango Tree developed could be uh, too costly to be carried at scale. They also developed a, a reduced cost version and uh, they are different in terms of, of, of the variable costs. So uh, the curriculum is, is the same for both, but the component of teacher training and materials is, is very different. Uh, uh, teacher training in the full cost version 
is done uh, extensively. They have uh, several sessions. Uh, several of, of them are, uh, they bring all the teachers together uh, to the same place and, and teach to everybody in the same place. And that's it's costly. In the reduced version, uh, it, this is done more, uh, this is firstly done by government officials instead of mango tree specialists, and it is done at the local level. Uh, in terms of materials, they both get scripted lessons for the, for the teachers that tell them how to do every session in, in, the, uh, in the curriculum. But uh, uh, the full cost version of the program also gave some materials for the children, like uh, uh, slates and chalk. And uh, uh, they also gave the, the teachers or each classroom a wall clock so that they could uh, keep track of time. Um, and then the, the full cost version also had a, a community engagement component, which uh, uh, led to parents being more involved in, in the, uh, by having meetings about the importance of using the native language. Uh, in terms of costs, the full cost version of the program uh, was, or the, this is only the uh, uh, variable cost, so this is not the development of the, of the materials is uh, separate from this and, and was common to both, but the uh, uh, cost per student in the full cost is uh, about $20. And then for the reduced cost, it's closer to seven. So the reduced cost version actually reduced the cost a lot. So uh, uh, we're trying to measure the impact of this uh, program right at the end of the program and uh, 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 five years after the, the program ended. Uh, uh, schools were randomized into one of three groups, the, the control group and one of the two branches of our treatment groups. Uh, um, it was difficult to follow students across eight years. So if we uh, think that this randomization happened when they were in grade one, we were expecting them to be in the first year of secondary education and, and uh, in year eight. And follow-up was difficult. So uh, 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 tests for attrition bias is important here. These are the, the, the tests that we run for attrition uh, at the uh, end line. So it, this is eight years after the beginning of the program or five years after the end. Well, uh, although we find like the control group had around 25% of attrition at the student level, which is relatively high, uh, we didn't find any attrition bias. And this is uh, a, in some part or in a great part uh, related to the great effort that our local team made in tracking the students through several years. Uh, and, and that this effort that we still have to carry out because we want to follow them uh, later because you're going to see that the results are pretty encouraging. Uh, um, but unfortunately, attrition doesn't seem to be related to treatment, and this encourages us to uh, be confident that uh, at least attrition bias is not a, a big problem. So this is a little bit of our, our uh, time lapse for, for data collection. Uh, we started in 2014 with students in the first grade. Uh, uh, we had 128 schools at, at that point, uh, uh, and we gathered data at the beginning of the school year. So this was before students were exposed to the uh, new treatment of uh, the literacy program. In 2016, which is uh, uh, at the end of 2016, we also visited the, the schools and the children, and we gathered information for when they supposed to be at, in grade three. We're going to see in a later slide that grade repetition was a great problem here, but supposedly they were going to be in grade three. Uh, and then, uh, which is the last year of program intervention because this uh, program was for grades one, two, and three. And then in 2021 and 2022, we expected to find them in the first year of secondary school. Unfortunately, uh, two factors combined here. First, uh, uh, Northern Uganda has an important repetition program, uh, but also the COVID pandemic was, had just struck and, and Ugandan schools remained closed for almost two years. So uh, we have a, a, a big uh, a school um, retention or lack of progression in these in this children. So uh, this is uh, the progression of, of, of children across the years. So in 2021, we asked them where, where, where they were, in which grade they were enrolled each year. Um, and some things that I want to uh, like highlight, it looks like uh, these boxes, show the, the, the grade they should be in if they followed perfectly through the years. And then the, the boxes that are highlighted, those are the ones uh, uh, where most children were. So those are the, like the modes of, of the distribution of each year. And we find that uh, even for the first year, about 31% of students were still in 2015 were still in grade one. 
So that's, that's a big uh, uh, retention, even for one year. And this, this trend continues over the years, although it's uh, um, it highlighted at the end where uh, almost nobody is either at their current year or even one year behind, right? By, by the end of, um, of 2021, uh, uh, most students are in grade six, um, I'm sorry, five. Uh, and only 16, uh, about 19% are in grade six or higher. If we try to see which grade they repeated the most, so we can see that uh, uh, about 35% of students repeated grade one, and then it goes relatively up until fourth grade. 72% of, of, of students repeated grade four. And then it goes down, but remember that you can't repeat a grade you haven't uh, reached yet. So it's not like students won't repeat grade six or seven. Uh, we don't know at the point, but uh, uh, this 72% rep repetition grade, uh, uh, it's very high. It's also worth noticing that majority of students uh, uh, reach grade four uh, uh, in 2019, right? So there's a lot the, uh, of repetitions here that could be related to the pandemic. What were the results? So these are the results at the end of the program. So at the end of, of uh, 2016, and we are presenting this. We had a long conversation about how to present these results. We're presenting this first in uh, standard deviations of our uh, combined score for the uh, Leblango, which is the, the, the native language that the program was carried out on, and in equivalent years of schooling. So I'm first going to present this uh, uh, in uh, standard deviations. And this is uh, uh, for Lebango, English, and math. Uh, we have huge impacts in terms of standard deviations. Uh, uh, the full cost version of the program had about 1.2 standard deviations effect. Uh, the reduced cost version, about 0 0.7. This is a, a very big effect in places as, uh, like in the top 90% of distribution of educational interventions. Um, in, even in English, which the program was not directly uh, uh, focused on, the effect is big. It has about half a standard deviation uh, in the full cost version of the program and 0 0.3 standard deviations for the reduced cost. So um, in terms of this, the reduced cost version of the program is getting between 54 and 58% of the impact of the full version of the cost of the program, even when it costs only 33% of the uh, uh, full cost version. Uh, we didn't see any impact in math, and we're not surprised to not see any impact in math in the uh, immediate uh, results. The problem was not focused on math in any way, uh, and uh, the results there are uh, uh, non-significant and small in size. Um, these uh, uh, standard deviations is not always very useful as an indicator. More, uh, a lot of people won't be able to understand them. We try to present this in equivalent years of schooling. So uh, in average, the, the, the control group gained about 0 0.16 or 0 0.17 standard deviations of learning every year. So if we rescale this, uh, 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 the students in the full cost version of the program learned like seven additional years of the control group uh, related to the control group. So, or, or gained the equivalent of what the, uh, uh, is, uh, control group learns in seven years, right? Uh, this is also relatively weird because the, most of the, of the children have not reached seven full years of, of schooling. So uh, it's a weird uh, way of measuring this. If we focus on the reading fluency indicator in Leblango, um, this, the control students can read 14 words per minute, which is very low. The reduced cost version of the program students they can read an additional seven units, uh, seven words per minute. And then the full cost version of the program students, they can read 14 uh, uh, words per, per minute uh, in addition to the 14 that the uh, control students could reach. So about 28 words per minute. This is still low uh, in terms of proficiency, but I think it's easier to understand. It's, it's focusing on only one of the components, but it's easier to understand. So we wanted to see uh, what happens to these students um, later in, in life. And we find that uh, at the end of year five, we still have about 0.7 standard deviations and point, uh, I'm sorry, the numbers that I did for reading is for 
the end of year five. Uh, uh, at the end of, of, of this fifth year, the um, students in the full cost version of the program can read 0 0.7 standard deviations uh, uh, or rank, have a score 0 0.7 uh, standard deviations higher and 0 0.4 in the reduced cost version. In Lodango, yes, we find uh, 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 smaller but uh, similar to what we found for the immediate impacts in terms of English, and we still found no impacts in uh, math, which did surprise us because we, we uh, thought that maybe teacher, uh, students who learned better how to read could understand other subjects easier, but it was not the case. We also uh, tried to see what happened to grade progression, and we can see it's a, a little bit dif difficult to read here, but uh, the main re uh, message here is that we can see students uh, uh, lagging less, right? Our treated students lag less than the uh, control students. And then in terms of other uh, outcomes later in life, uh, we don't see any effect in working outside of home or in sexual behavior. Uh, uh, we also have to take into account that uh, the sexual behavior, very few students had any uh, sex at the, uh, at the time that we were measuring, about only 10% of the, of the sample, but no effects there. So some uh, conclusions, there's very problematic great progression in Uganda, which was made dismal uh, due to COVID pandemic. Uh, the program had long, long lasting uh, effects with positive into English. Uh, these effects didn't promote math, and, uh, um, but partially alleviated the, program, the, the problem of uh, great repetition. And we found no effects in either sexual, working, sexual or working behavior. And that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. So, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Jennifer, and I'm going to, like it was mentioned, I'm going to present to you a work that I can see. But so it's me or it's, it's them. So, this was done with Jerry Berman, Alan Sanchez, Santiago Cueto, Marta Favara, and Marta Favara. Uh, none of them are here, but that's okay. <laughs> and basically, uh, like it was mentioned, what we wanted to see was the association between cognitive skills and educational outcomes later in life. Okay, so as soon as I can <laughs> tell you, I will start. Yeah, so this is basically what I told you. And just as a bit of an introduction, uh, we all know, all, all of you here, we all know how important education is. And it has been said many, many times, and some people might say that it's not important anymore, uh, but in low and middle income countries, uh, this is still an element, a key element for um, mobility and for people to be able to access better opportunities in life. So why are we focusing on cognitive skills? Uh, because these are key for children to be able to store and analyze every type of knowledge that they get, whether it's at home or whether it's the one that they get in formal education at school. Now, so the base, any basic type of knowledge, you require cognitive skills to be able to analyze and to store that. So in, in low and middle income countries, there is little evidence about the role of cognitive skills. Uh, I mean, cognitive skills as as like working memory or inhibitory control. Not sometimes, not as we sometimes say that cognitive skills are like math or uh, reading comprehension test performance, but cognitive skills is what they are. There's not much evidence of that. And this can be due to the fact that this is hard to measure. It's hard to get tools to measure cognitive skills like more precisely. So this is why we have this question. So which of these cognitive skills predict domain specific learning outcomes and educational attainment? Specifically, we focus on four cognitive skills, declarative memory, uh, inhibitory control, working memory, and implicit learning, uh, which we refer to as foundational cognitive skills. Uh, two of these are part of what is more known in the literature as executive function. Okay, so I already told you the research questions, and we want to see which of these cognitive skills uh, have the strongest association with educational outcomes, and if this, uh, this prediction and constants are constant across countries. So, to tell you the results from now, so we do find the, these cognitive skills predict educational outcomes, especially in the case in long-term memory and working memory, so the memory-related cognitive skills. Uh, implicit learning doesn't seem to be playing that big of a role in both countries. Uh, we also find e important associations between inhibitory control and math test performance. And finally, our results are robust to the inclusion of value added. 
So the data that we use is the data from the Young Lice study. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous study, but just to tell you a bit more about it, this study has been following two cohorts of children since 2002. We have the younger cohort and the older cohort, uh, which, were na which were born in 1994, 2001 respectively, in four countries, Ethiopia, India, Peru, and Vietnam. So they have five in-person visits and five phone calls, uh, which were done during COVID, so the phone survey. So the data collected in this study covers a wide range of indicators, including background characteristics, parent and child aspirations, household and individual investments, and cognitive skills, and many more. So we only use data from the younger cohort, uh, which, one, which was around one year uh, in 2002, 15 years old in 2016, and about 20 to 21 years old at the, la at the time of the last phone call in 2021. Our main variables come from round four, five, call two and five. And finally, we do use uh, information from round one and two to make uh, to construct some control variables. Additionally, the study started collecting data on the siblings of these uh, index children, which are the main participants that the study has been following uh, since round three. Okay, but it's not the same. It is worth mentioning that it's not like it's at the exact survey for the siblings. Too. So we just collect a specific data. Uh, which will have some implications for uh, some some models that we would like to run. So in Peru, the data was collected from the young for the younger siblings, while in Ethiopia it was collected for the siblings closest in age. We use data only from the younger siblings for the household fixed effects model. So these are educational outcomes. Uh, the main ones that I'm going to present today are at 15 years old. And the community skills data come from a tool that was uh, using 2013, when the younger cohort was 12 years old. So this is called RACER. RACER is the Rapid Assessment of Cognitive and Emotional Regulation, and it's a tablet-based administer, a uh, self-administered tablet-based software designed to measure each of these cognitive skills that I mentioned at the beginning through an interactive task, each of them. So uh, just to give you, I told you the first, the four cognitive skills that we have, which are long-term memory, inhibitory control, working memory, and implicit control. Just to give you an idea to what these are, uh, they're very self-explanatory, but long-term memory is the ability to be able to store and, and retain knowledge even when it's not in the environment anymore. Uh, inhibitory control is the ability to focus and uh, suppress any distractor that one might have. And uh, working memory is the ability to bring back stored knowledge and to use it even when it's not there anymore. Uh, and finally, implicit learning is the ability to learn without being conscious about it, okay? So uh, due to the design, RACER is relatively bias-free. So it doesn't rely on language of cultural or cultural references, but it relies on shapes and colors. Okay, each of the tasks have both challenge and trials. Uh, it, we, perform, we measure the performance or is of each task in, in either the number of correct answers, the response time, the accuracy, or a combination of the last two. So just to give you an idea, uh, you have a tablet, for example, for inhibitory control, and it's la it has an imaginary line at, at the middle, and you have like the center of the right side and the center of the left side. And the child would have to press at the center of either the right side of the left or the left side. And what we can measure here is the response time, how fast the child is, or the accuracy, how close to the center of the top of the how close to the center of the right side he's pressing. Okay, so if, for inhibitory control, we use a, a mix of both response times and accuracy. So uh, our model is very simple. We use an OLS model uh, where we have the outcome variables, which is either the highest grade achieved at age 15, the standardized scores in PPT, math, and reading comprehension. Uh, we do some things with uh, lower secondary school, uh, with finishing low, lower secondary school education at age, 15, at age 19 or being enrolled in higher education at age 20, but I won't be presenting those today. And then we have the FCA, the foundational cognitive skills vector, which we include one at a time in each of the regressions. We have basic controls at the child level, at the household level, controls for the games, and finally, community of very fixed effects. So these are our results. It's really boring to see a lot of uh, coefficients I've been told many times. So let me just show you what it's what it's important about these results. So we have first important associations between long-term memory and working memory with all of the outcomes. 
in both Peru and Ethiopia. And the coefficients in Peru range from 8 to 29%, and the coefficients in Ethiopia range from, I think, 5 to 19% uh, of, of a standard deviation. So this is very good. And we also see in inhibitory control that, like I mentioned at the beginning, our main results are with math test performance. Although we do see something, uh, more, something else in Peru going on there, but uh, we will see that it's not constant within our, or the other models. So, and finally, in implicit learning, we see nothing in Ethiopia, and we do see something there, uh, a couple of things there in Peru, but again, this won't be uh, consistent with the rest of the tables. So yeah, so this is very good <laughs> in principle. We were really happy when we saw these results. It's very straightforward. However, these results could be the, the associations that we see between these skills and these uh, educational outcomes could be happening due to a previous association between, educate, between cognitive skills and previous educational outcomes when the children were younger. So for that, to try to account for that, we include the value added model where we are, we are controlling for the last test scores at age 12. Okay, so this is it. all the controls are the same and it's still there. So again, <laughs> the results remain good. We do see that most of our coefficients are the significant associations that we saw before are still there, which is very good. We do lose some of them, as you can see, for example, here in long-term memory and the association that, was, that we had with math test performance, but it's not there anymore. Uh, but basically all of them are there. Uh, although all of the coefficients are uh, smaller. So that, that's, but we basically see that long term memory in, and working memory in both Peru and Ethiopia still present strong associations. And in the case of inhibitory control, we only see uh, the association with math test performance. Uh, and in the case, well, if this is was mentioning. So uh, finally, we also did a household fixed effects model to try to account for possible omitted variables bias, like parent quality of investments and so on. So again, we do have good results. And you can see this is the column three and six in both tables. We only can do this for PPBT and highest grade attained due to, like I mentioned, the sample restriction that we have from the civilians data. And Again, we find strong associations in the case of PPBT in both countries with long-term memory and working memory. Uh, again, in yeah, in the case of in the case of Peru, we also see something there with inhibitory control. However, there is not much going on. We highest grade attain. There is something in Peru, but we don't see the same in Ethiopia. So it's not that consistent. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have time. <laughs> So finally, like I mentioned, we do find strong associations between long-term memory and working memory. So the memory-related cognitive skills, which is uh, like intuitive from the literature, as well as is a result, uh, a result between, that we find between inhibitory control and math test performance is also consistent with what we saw in the literature. Again, implicit learning is a bit of a more complex skill in measuring and also in, in seeing exactly where does it play a role. So we are not that surprised to not find nothing that significant there. And according to our value added specification, the results are consistent. So still we see something with uh, the memory related skills. And again, we see the result with inhibitory control. Uh, from a policy perspective, our first results, so this table basically, tell us that, yes, it is important to invest in cognitive skills. They are important. And our value-added results can might be saying that there is something that it is worth investing in remedi remediation policies for older children. So most of the policies aimed at education or the development of cognitive skills is focused on younger children, preschool children. However, the, in the case of low- and middle-income countries specifically, there's a lot of older children that do not receive any type of policy or do have a terrible education, you know, the cycle of poverty and so on. So uh, what our model could be saying is that it is worth investing in this uh, policy saying at older children, not just the preschool period, because there is something happening between 12 and 15 years old that could be uh, done to help these children that did not receive the best education when they were younger. So finally, uh, this work is part of a series of works uh, funded by the NIH research program. So this is the last one. The first thing, five, four works focus on 
uh, why is what affects cognitive skills? And this one is the one that wraps everything up by saying, yeah, we care about cognitive skills, but we care because this matters for educational outcomes. Okay, so that's basically it. I have, I have some minutes left, but that's okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Rubaya Moshed. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. I am on the job market. Um, today, I'll be sharing some preliminary, preliminary findings from one of my more recent chapters, where I'll be talking about um, ind individuals' education levels and their voting behavior using evidence from rural Bangladesh. So basically, the two concepts here that I'll be talking about is education and political participation. So in setting this research question, um, one of the guideline guiding theories was the civic education theory, which says that education instills essentially individuals with civic knowledge and awareness uh, that, that in turn increases their likelihood of voting. So basically in this paper, we test the central implication of this theory and we look at the, look at whether with each additional education level, and thereby assuming that that develops skills, knowledge, and awareness in people who are going uh, to the higher education levels, are they more likely to vote in national and local elections? Just to give you a roadmap, um, I thought that I, I should share some certain details so that we can together better understand the context, context and setting of this paper. So um, first, a little bit about Bangladesh. It's a South Asian lower middle income country. For this setting of this paper, I think it's um, important to understand the political climate of Bangladesh, which I'll be talking about. And this is interesting because Bangladesh does have a sort of unstable political climate, which makes it more important, I feel, to look into things like electoral participation, what leads people to either vote, vote more or vote less. And I uh, being an educationist, I, I really wanted to look at the role of education here. Bangladesh's education system. Basically, I'm looking at education levels in this paper. That's what I mean by education. So we have primary, secondary, higher, secondary, and tertiary. So I'm, I'm, those are the levels I'm looking at. A little bit about the election system in Bangladesh. So there's basically national elections and local level elections. I look at both in this paper. Um, so to be eligible to vote in any of these elections, you have to be 18 years or older. Older for local elections. There are the Upojala elections, which are the sub-district elections. So there are districts and then sub-districts within the districts. I look at that as one of the local elections. There's also um, a small unit. So this is the smallest rural administrative unit in Bangladesh. It's called Union Porishad. So there are also elections at that level. So I also, that's very local. So I also look at that election. Just to give you an idea about voter turnout in Bangladesh. So, um, <sighs> The International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, they have some data on this, and their data over the years show that Bangladesh's voter turnout rates in national parliamentary, parliamentary elections has been more or less over 50% over the years. So that's, that's just to give you an idea about the enthusiasm and the perception towards voting in Bangladesh. And um, uh, there are political scientists who have described the, the, that the voting day, the, elect, the going to elections and the enthusiasm. And Schaefer describes, this, describes that Bangladeshi people have a certain enthusiasm undimmed by political violence on election day. So uh, you can see from the picture of the women lining up to vote that there is that certain enthusiasm. It is very important to understand the political climate then that so voting, the system of voting is one thing, but there is a lot of literature by political economists, political scientists describing Bangladesh's political climate as um, clientelist authoritarianism disguised as democracy. So there's a lot of patron client relationships, a lot of power plays, a lot of power dynamics there, and it's been described to be have developed over aspects of money, muscle, threats, and violence. So it's a very, many have referred to this as toxic politics or political politics. So that's just to give you an idea about that. Also, please note that there is controversy about the credibility of some national elections in Bangladesh. One such election I'll be talking about in this paper, which is the 2014 national election. Um, also important to the setting of this paper is the literature that suggests that 
in Bangladesh, there's also, it's also important to understand who is more easily won over by politicians and the powerfully politi uh, the, pow the powerful politicians. So there's literature suggesting that people in rural areas and people who are more socioeconomically disadvantaged tend to be easily uh, manipulated by the politically powerful because the politically powerful, they want the votes. So they offer protection in these patron-client relationships. And putting that in the context of this paper, I wondered whether the education has a role here and whether it is the case that maybe less educated people are easily won over too. And then Professor Wood from University of Bath, he has a he has a paper where he says that it's more difficult for disadvantaged people to step uh, step up and stand against wrongdoing. But my question is, does that mean that those who are educated, we more easily stand up against wrongdoing? Do we call a spade a spade? So that led me to my question here to think that do we expect education to play that role? Do we expect that the more educated we are? we will call a spade a spade, and we will be more critical, more aware. Besides those motivating questions, there's also big literature on this spread all over the world, where uh, the linkage between education and political participation is well established. So the mechanism there is that it is assumed that when we go to formal education, we're exposed to subjects like civic studies, social studies, things like economics, politics, history, and being exposed to all these subjects uh, gives us a certain exposure to more criticality, more awareness. And so more educated people are assumed to be more engaged with politics, more interested in politics. They have a greater concern for election and they, uh, they are assumed to have a greater feeling of responsibility of playing one's role as a citizen and voting as a part of that. So um, that is the, there's a lot of theory explaining why there would be a direct link between education and voting, and it is established that this linkage should be positive. So the more that you go to education, you're expected to be more critical, more aware, more politically engaged, hence more likely to vote. So um, the literature, and I'm still updating this, I, 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 as far as I gather, it's there are two types of results. Some studies in Global North show that there, there is that positive association, and that has moved on to uh, consider things like, is it a proxy, is it a direct effect? But there's also literature that shows that there's no significant linkage between education and voting. So in the global south, especially in Bangladesh, there is a little to no evidence on this. So I really wanted to look into that. So I basically test whether there's an association between higher education levels and people, uh, people's likelihood of voting in different national and um, local elections. The hypothesis following from all that uh, theory that I showed you is that there would be an, a significant association and that would be positive. So we're expecting that more educated people would be more likely to vote. I use um, a data that's uh, um, collected in Bangladesh. It's called the Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey data. This is basically a panel data, but I use uh, only the 2015 round because voting information is only available there. There's politics there as well, maybe perhaps, but uh, so it's a cross-sectional data in the end. And um, it has information on education level and voting and other demographic characteristics that I can use in the model. Basically, the dependent variables here are whether people vote or not, yes or no dummy variables with two categories in different elections. I'll show you the elections. And um, I have a range of social demographic uh, controls, but the main covariate of interest is level of education. So um, the categories there would be no formal, primary, secondary, higher secondary, and tertiary. So in each case, when I'm talking about primary, secondary, higher secondary, and tertiary, the base category that I'm comparing to is no formal education. That's just a snapshot of the different variables. So there are two national elections, two Upojala elections and union Polishot, two union Polishot elections, so four local elections. So these were all questions in the survey. Did you vote then in this election? And there were yes or no answers. And um, so I used those dummy variables, but um, I also wanted to see whether um, when I aggregate these answers, I, I, uh, I constructed a count variable just to see that uh, what the over, what an integrated um, version of these results are. So that is basically just uh, constructing a count variable from all the yeses and nos 
in the, all the uh, different variables. So the more yeses that a person has, the higher their score for that count variable. That's just to see the magnitude of voting of each individual. For the dummy variables, I'm using a simple logic model. And for the count variable, which is one variable, I'm using the Poisson model. I won't go into the nitty gritty of the equations. Just before going to the results, I, I am assuming that different aged individuals would have different educational experience maybe, and maybe perhaps different voting behavior. I do um, do uh, an initial age cohort analysis where I divide the sample into different age groups. So um, I look at the voting behavior in, uh, across these age cohorts as well. So what story does the evidence tell us? Remember the hypothesis that we started with is that more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Um, I'll quickly go over the story. In the case of the 2008 and 2014 national election, uh, we're seeing that the more educated people are, the primary, secondary, higher secondary, tertiary level, the less likely they are to vote. And there are several cases of this, 2008, 2014. Similarly, in the Upojale elections, similar instances where the more educated you are at different levels, uh, significantly less likely to vote. Same with the union Croatia elections. I won't go into the numbers, but the story is that, that in several cases, the more educated you are, apparently the less likely individuals are to vote. When I look at in, um, whether they've ever voted in a national or local election, similar results. And then in that integrated um, count variable where I look at the score, interestingly, that is where the only significant association is showing that when you're primary educated compared to have people with no formal education, you're more likely to vote. So they have higher scores. Finally, and a result that's making sense because everything else is saying that for some reason, more like, more, the more educated you are, the less likely you are to vote. The age cohort analysis, I'm still fine tuning this, but apparently at this stage, I'm seeing that for the older two cohorts, there are mainly there's no significant association, but when there is, there's a positive a significant association in some cases between education and voting. For the younger cohorts, there are more instances of a negative significant correlation between education and voting. So to sum up, the main punchline of this paper is that apparently, evidently, more the more educated you are, the less likely you are to vote in several cases. And apparently this is more observed in the case of the younger cohorts. Now, interestingly, there's literature that says that in these surveys, people tend to over-report their voting. And the more educated you are, apparently they exaggerate their answers more. So even if they didn't vote, they say yes. That makes me wonder that even despite that exaggeration, these results are even more striking to me. Why is this the case? Before I go into inferences, given the political climate of Bangladesh, I do have to clarify this. I'm not going after any political party. I'm looking at these particular elections because the data allows me to look at only these elections. So I am politically neutral. <laughs> so I have to say that before going into um, the inferences. And it does hurt me growing up in Bangladesh to talk about politics in Bangladesh as toxic or political, but it does motivate me as well to look into these issues uh, more deeply. As far as I gather, there could be three reasons why the result is so counterintuitive. One could be that Perhaps the way we're expecting that education should um, politically engage or make people more critical and aware, perhaps uh, the education system that we have doesn't have the elements to ensure that. That could be one thing. Another thing could be that there has now become a certain level of, dis of disengagement. So the more educated uh, that an individual is, perhaps they've come to feel that their vote won't matter, that they play insignificant roles in the elections. And that certain disengagement has perhaps become more prominent through their education. Third, and um, uh, uh, some, um, there's a paper on this from Zimbabwe, perhaps more educated individuals are choosing to refrain from voting because they don't want to legitimize an illegitimate electoral system. So it could also be a form of protest. So disengagement could have gone, gone to that level. And evidence from Zimbabwe does show that the more educated people are, the more likely they are to not want to legitimate that illegitimate system. So in terms of taking this forward in research and policy, um, in my PhD, I was 
unfortunate that I only got to work with secondary data since so I have lots of data issues, limitations. I, I haven't been able to look at this causally. Um, I would really like to take this forward and see what works. So what elements can we add in the education system that actually translates into the outcomes later in life that we're expecting, that we want our citizens to vote, to be responsible, to be more altruistic, civically engaged. So I, uh, to this wider audience, I, I would love some advice for funding, postdocs, how to go about that and take this research forward. Because I think on one hand, there's things to do in the education system, but there's also things to do in trying to make the institution of democracy and elections stronger and to protect the sanctity of those. I would like to end with a Bangla saying. Um, the saying goes, Jai kono niti, shehi kore rajniti. Loosely translated, this means only one without any principle goes into politics. I heard this from my grandfather. Many of us grew up hearing this. So the saying is that if you don't have, you only go into politics if you don't have principles. The question I want to end with here, here with is, is it the case that more educated people in Bangladesh have been able to relate this saying more to reality? With that food for thought, I'd like to end here. Thank you. So I would just dive in and raise your hands. Maybe we'll, yeah, I'll see a hand there. So maybe we start with that end and then we'll see where we end up. So, Ravana, thank you. Um, I, I want to flip your problem around. What What is your thinking about why less educated people vote? So, so let's collect a few questions, yeah? Yeah. Uh, question to the first presenter. Um, so you have these large positive results on reading. Usually poor reading skills mean that um, students not really understand how the words form the language basically and with this uh big improvements do you have any way of measuring is there really like um a different way of understanding how language works beyond just basically speed of reading great do we have yeah great <clears throat> hi thanks thanks a lot for those presentations i have a question about the uganda one um uh it, it, is there discussion around um, removing the system that forces children to repeat grades in the first place and just to progress, make them progress automatically? Is that something that has come up as a potential um, other way of addressing these? And does your evidence cast any light on, on that kind of idea? There's a question there. Maybe in the meantime, I'll ask a question to Jennifer as well. So. I was intrigued by your results on, on inhibitory control, which kind of comes closer to the socio-emotional skills. And the Young Lives data has quite a bit of other information on socio-emotional skills, you know, like uh, self-control, self-efficacy, agency. Did you look at the relationship with this? Because it could help us understand a bit more on, on how to, to measure this, which is really, I think, holds us back in this field. And then maybe a fourth question there. Thank you. Um, my question is is sort of for both the first two presenters. Uh, so it's interesting that such large increases in literacy didn't sort of translate into strong improvements into youth's ability to progress and also didn't translate into improvements in math. Do you have a plan to look at other types of skills as these kids get older um, and then a hypothesis for why those really large gains in literacy didn't result in more success later on? And I think similarly building off of that question is, um, you know, what do we think that link between socio socio-emotional learning and these more cognitive skills can mean for progression. Wonderful. So we'll take these maybe in, in, in sequence. So do you want to go first, Ricardo? Sure. So the first question about how we understand how like literacy means more than the speed at where they read. Um, I think that's a very good question. Uh, uh, at this point, I think from what we've studied, we can learn I think we can conclude two things. Uh, I'm not entirely sure we'll answer that question. The first is that the children in Northern Uganda are not learning to read appropriately, right? They, uh, by any indicator that we have, they uh, uh, are even reading really slowly, uh, and that's way beyond the threshold uh, uh, for understanding what you're reading. 
or using our more aggregate uh, uh, indicators, it's it's I think it's evident that they are not learning at least far beyond what they were supposed to. Uh, the second second thing that I think we can uh, learn from what we've done is that uh, the problem has had an impact on that, uh, uh, on on what they can learn and what they can understand from what they're uh, reading. So uh, I think that that is clear. What other measurements we can do uh, uh, to to know exactly at what level they are? I think that's a more difficult question. I don't think that the study was prepared to 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 go to that. Um, so I, I won't be speculating about that. Um, the, the the question about whether we should uh, suppress this retention uh, regulation that's a very good question. I think, uh, and we've debated this a little bit. So. Uh, in theory, what they are doing right now is teaching at the right level. So it's not letting people who have not learned the, uh, the, the appropriate material progress to a, a different grade. Uh, this is also combined with the fact that uh, students that uh, have economic uh, problems, they are forced to repeat the grade because they have to leave. Uh, so I think that that second part should be taken care of. I'm not sure. Uh, what the policy on uh, uh, teaching at the right level or, or forcing students to be promoted to a grade if they don't really have the, the, um, the background or, or the necessary information to, to take advantage of what they are going to learn that grade. And then um, if we have plans to uh, uh, get more data, yes, we are, we are at, uh, trying to, to get more data uh, of these students in the future. We think uh, it's uh, relevant to keep track of them. It, we right now have some data we haven't exploded on, on non-cognitive skills, uh, which is uh, uh, what we are doing uh, in the next weeks. Um, uh, but uh, for other technical skills, we have not necessarily designed yet what we're going to measure. We wanted to, to uh, know what they were doing, uh, like progression into secondary school, but it's, it's impossible at this moment. And we don't really know if it's going to be possible uh, anytime soon if they don't really go into secondary school. Uh, but other uh, um, non-academic non uh, indicators, I think we will measure uh, more things related to how they do in the labor mar market, because if they don't progress into secondary education, they will end up going to the labor market. And uh, I think the sexual behavior is also something that we will uh, tackle, because as, as it becomes more frequent, I think we will be able to explore it more. Great, can we turn to Jennifer? Yes, uh, so about the potential relationship between socio-emotional uh, skills and cognitive skills. So I think we did look into it because you know it would make sense, but I think we didn't find any strong associations, even in the case of inhibitory control. And one thing one has to take into account is that these two were measured very differently. So RACER is a specialized tool to capture cognitive skills, and cognitive skills are very different for uh, socio-emotional skills, even if they are a bit related. Whereas socio-emotional skills were measured in the survey through questions, you know, so it's yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, and it's scale. And I'm not, 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 not always all of the all of the points were asked to the children. So I think that's why we don't find a strong associations there. Uh, it would make sense, but at the same time, it's hard to say. Because the thing about skills in general is that they are difficult to measure. Yeah. And but did, you, did you find a relationship between inhibitory control and some of the other? Because that's kind of halfway between cognitive and, and socio-emotional. In a way, but inhibitory control is more like, you know, like the, um, I know it's like you have the, the self-regulation and all and inhibitory control talks about like the ability to regulate one's behavior, but we didn't find something okay. there. Can, do you want to say more on whether there's any follow-up that you're going to build on? Oh, yeah, about the, it was also about the social skill. Sorry, I'm a bit uh, spacing now. Uh, but yeah, it would make sense, like I said, but we, we haven't done any further research on that. But maybe it would be worth doing with, because we now have a round seven going on, and maybe it's something there, because they are, the children are way older now, so maybe something there would come up. Thanks. Rubaya? Um, so, um, First, the academic answer. The literature says that less educated people are more easily swayed, more easily won over. So imagine a politician coming to someone and um, saying that, please vote for me and uh, I'll give you something in return, whether that's monetary or something in the form of protection. So the literature says that it's more easy to 
um, win over less educated individuals. From my experience growing up in Bangladesh, anecdotally, perhaps there is an issue of agency as well. So in, in this, this is rural data. So I've seen in rural settings in election times, they're like a trucks of um, saris and food that's taken. So these are monetary incentives, sort of gifts are given to sort of please vote for me, I'll give you a gift. And maybe lesser educated people, um, they have maybe less agency and they also take that at face value perhaps that, oh, that person gave me this gift, that person is gonna give me this protection, I'll vote for vote for that person. That's my initial understanding of it. Okay, let's go to a second round of questions. Uh, I don't know where the mics are. Yeah, let's start there. Yeah. Um, the first is um, for Rubia on um, education and voting. Do you have any literature from developing country context? So based on what you just answered, um, my understanding is that doesn't necessarily play out everywhere. So yeah, if you could comment on that. And then on, the, on Ricardo, if you could speak on... Um, sexual behavior and why you were measuring that and how it links with reading uh, and how you measured that. Um, thanks. This, maybe let's move there and then we come there. Oh. Okay, so my question is to uh, Jennifer. So I was wondering if you, in your research, considered um, employability and um, the uh, cognitive skills kind of in, in your research, since I think these children, they are ab around 21 now, so they probably um, have completed secondary school, or even uni. So if there's something around the association between employability and these cognitive skills. There was a question there, yeah. Um, so my question is for Rubea. Um, so I, I, I was trying to reconcile your findings that people with tertiary education vote less with the fact that Bangladesh came, emerged out of a historical moment where students were the ones that led the independence movement, right? And university students. Um, so two questions there, I guess, is um, how can we reconcile that? And two, do you have any other broader measures of political participation and political engagement uh, that don't necessarily involve uh, voting in an electoral authoritarian region? Wonderful. Let's, let's collect these. Um, can we start with Rubia? So there was a question on the, hmm. the literature of developing countries yes. and then the special role that students play. Hmm. Um, so to the literature, um, I'm still working on that. I'm going to the literature. I found one study in based in Zimbabwe by uh, Krook et al, where they've looked at this particular um, issue and they've, uh, I, I, that, that's where uh, I, I read about them saying that more educated people um, use refraining from voting as a form of protest. So I'm still looking for more literature. I haven't found more yet, but I think it's not only to do with less developing or low middle income countries, but I guess the political climate also matters. So it has to be a political climate that, it, that perhaps doesn't have as much freedom, perhaps is economically quite stable, more stable, but political climate is a big issue there. Um, uh, to uh, Emmerich's question, we have a glorious history of university students bringing us our independence, them fighting. Even now, our young people go to the streets for, to protest different issues. But you have to understand, and I, I might, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> because this is in the UK, it's easier for me to say, but the situation is such that freedom of speech has gone to a very, very critical stage that university students are not in that position anymore. In 1971, when we gained our independence, that was led from Dhaka University. Now, the situation, if anybody who speaks up against anything, it's quite difficult. And I don't think I've, uh, I was a university student of that university. So, I, and I've been in, uh, in university these, over this last decade, and I found it hard to, and this is not just on a national level, even in wrongdoings around me. It's difficult to speak up because there are reper repercussions for speaking up. I think that has played a role. Um, in my other PhD, so my, my PhD looks at labor market outcomes and non-labor market outcomes. So the part of non-labor market outcomes, I do look at civic engagement. So that does show that more educated, their education and things like um, people um, contributing to society in different forms. So that is the non-voting part where I sort of look at 
how people civically engage. I don't know whether that answers your second question. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, can you say a bit more about employability? Oh, employability. No, we didn't. <laughs> so I, I think the question was about uh, 19, 20 years, because the, the, the age that the, child, the children, we say children because we're used to calling them children in the in young life, but uh, they are adults now. They are the younger cohort is 23, 24, I think, this year. So uh, we did, uh, so Ethiopia and Peru have very different education systems, like the grades. Uh, in Peru, you only got up to, you have primary, secondary, and 11, 11 years of school. And in Ethiopia, it's different. And not everyone access to like year 10 and 11 and so on. So um, we did look at the, because the fund survey allow us to look at the, in Ethiopia, like finished secondary education, because people going up is a bit more difficult, like the, the percentage is lower. And in Peru, we saw those who got into university, who started university or have finished, not very unlikely, but yeah. And then we, we did find positive associations between those outcomes, um, uh, again, the memory related cognitive skills. So yeah, it was consistent with those two skills mainly. I think we found something a bit there, again, with inhibitory control, nothing with implicit learning, like, like in the previous results. But yeah, we, we do found those. I haven't talked about them here, but they are in the paper. Okay, Ricardo, can you say a bit more about how you came or what is the motivation that you measured sexual behavior and what do you see as a yeah. useful ways forward here? So when we had the results for the uh, immediate impact of the program, we, uh, we realized it was very, very big. And we uh, speculated that uh, a program with uh, such important uh, effects on learning could um, induce students to stay in school longer and even and be more likely to make the progression into secondary school. Uh, and uh, as we've seen in previous presentations today, the, uh, when children start to, or adolescents start working, uh, they gain access to their own money and start doing things that would not do if they were exclusively in school. So uh, one of the behaviors that we th uh, thought uh, uh, could happen is that uh, students who dropped out more could uh, uh, start uh, uh, their sexual relationships earlier. Uh, uh, as <laughs> almost nobody has left uh, primary education yet, it, it's been difficult to, to uh, test that. Thanks. Let's have another round. Um, there's a question there, another one there. Um, maybe I can kick off while you collect the mics. Um, on on the, the literature, there's one interesting paper on Sub-Sahara Africa that looks at the relationship between elite capture and disengagement. And I wonder whether you, because you have local results as well, mm -hmm. and I understand that there's some variation across Bangladesh in, in, in kind of elite capture locally, where you can exploit that to test that hypothesis that what they present is that if there's more, if, if your political competitors all come from the same elite, then there's much more disengagement. So that would be really great if you can try to test that with the data. Uh, sorry, so another Hi, question. Um, so I wanted to understand whether you are um, looking at the regional variation and income variation within regions because that can explain a lot in our uh, in bangladesh um one and i just wanted to just add that maybe you want to downplay the reduction in the political space argument in here because you're you're looking up to 2014 national election the uh, you know, the reduction in the public space has actually exacerbated over the last 10 years. Uh, but 2008 national election, 2009 uh, local government election, uh, Facebook was not that popular. So the Digital Security Act that has been used to recur public uh, freedom of speech would not have had today's impact. So um, that you need to probably incorporate a little bit in your explanation, like, Fair point that you know the tendency to speak out may have gone down, but it's a more recent phenomena. Just for the sake that you know, social media was not a big thing in two thousand eight, two thousand nine in Bangladesh. So you need to look into that more deeply uh, and find you know explanations that would fit that climate better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
on the election um, paper, uh, I just want to relate your results to what um, it's going on in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So for example, um, I know every election has key issues that um, are presented to voters and that actually drive out whether people go out to vote or not. For example, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in recent votes, you could see a lot of youth and middle class actually pushed out. And if you look at in the past, um, it tends to actually uh, share a similar trend with your story. But more recent times, whereby the election issues revolve around um, maybe issues that are concerned of mid, uh, middle classes, they also actually have been seen to actually vote in those situations. So I don't know, maybe the election issues also play a role in kind of what drives voters in Bangladesh. There was one more question there. Uh, if we could get a mic there. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for all the oh, sorry. miles walking. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for the long distance. Yeah. Hi, um, my question is for uh, Jennifer and Rubaya. So I noticed that both of you are using secondary data analysis. So sometimes like the primary data could be collected for a very different purpose. Uh, and then when it comes to cognitive uh, ability testing, you know, the, new, the enumerators, I had to kind of like go through like very intensive trainings in like psychological testings. So yeah, basically I just wonder like your insights on kind of using secondary data and then if you had the chance to redesign it, what you would like to add or yeah, anything from you would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, let's go. Well, let's take one more here and then I think we're gonna be very close to, to closing. Okay, team uh, no, just, uh, um, I thought uh, there was a slight comment and specifically a question in terms of uh, uh, when you're, uh, the results that we are talking about with regards to elections and uh, education are not surprising to me at all, uh, because we thought that uh, uh, at least from an Indian context, it was almost reasonable to get that distribution. If it were the other way around, I'd have been surprised. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to ask if you've looked also looked at uh, this cut from a gender perspective in terms of who's putting uh, more, because there is a correlation between education and gender there as well. And uh, uh, one of the rationales uh, uh, from an Indian context is more like uh, the idea of agency that you did mention earlier does play a large amount of part because uh, elections are almost seen as this uh, festival of agency where regardless of whatever else happens, you are able to register an opinion at one point of time, uh, which is a lot more important for folks who are a lot more disenfranchised in other aspects of life compared to the first one. That's great. Thank, Thank you. Um, let's try to keep the answers short, if you don't mind, uh, because we're running against time. Jennifer, do you, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, so about... Uh, so Eraser was uh, created by a psychologist with help of... Uh, I think it's an economist that did all the programming and all because it was really to get all the data that we wanted uh, to be able to get like time and so on. It, it had to be really well programmed. But the design was by the psychologist that I got to meet. And she was really like, you know, this. they have a whole paper about the implement, the, cura the creation of this and how it has been tested and it has been validated. So yeah, uh, would I change something about it? So the thing is that this, this is a longitudinal survey. Uh, I wouldn't benefit from changing anything because the idea is to take to take, make the participants take racer again in order to compare these results. And now that the younger cohort is actually in the labor market, we can do some we can do something there because you know actually racer has been tested in this round again. So uh, and it's really easy to test, and the compliance is very high because it doesn't require that much, and it's like kind of a relief from the survey, which is very long. So yeah, I, I wouldn't change anything exactly there. Uh, but if anything, I do would be more precise with the tasks. So none of, uh, we see that implicit learning, for example, really hard to measure. It really doesn't yield that many results. So I, I, would, I would drop that one and I would try to focus more on the literature to see what makes sense. So the first uh, executive function, definitely I would keep measuring that because it really has really a lot of backup from the literature. Wonderful. Rubia, do you want to okay. answer the questions? Um, to uh, the question at the back, I did um, account for so, uh, regional and socioeconomic variation that's in the models. 
I would disagree with you on the social media point. We can uh, discuss this more over coffee, but I do not think protesting on social media is the same as what our students did in 1971. I think if social media was there back then, we wouldn't have become independent because it's it, I, I, that difference in opinion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, election issues, uh, so election issues. Thank you for that point. I, I, I will, that's a very good point. I'll think about that and specific election issues in the different elections. Um, secondary data, Vicky, um, one of the biggest struggles with my PhD using secondary data was always feeling, oh, I wish there was more data and especially more richness in the data. In Bangladesh, especially with the educational data, and when I look at things like Young Lives data, RISE data, I wish there was more data on students' abilities, educational performance, intergenerational indicators. So I, I would change that. And I do say that in my PhD as well, that we really need to add these because these surveys have been going on for a long time without adding those very, very needed data to do educational research. Um, Thank you, uh, Arvind, right, uh, for that comment. Agency, definitely, and definitely, that's been a big thing, disenfranchisement um, uh, agency. And I, the gender perspective, I haven't looked into that yet, but I agree that would be very, very interesting. I would like to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any final thoughts, Ricardo? Any of the questions? Uh, I think it's important, and we do these long follow-ups, uh, uh, more frequently because a, a fade out can be a very important part of the of the um, of the effect of the of the of the programs uh, and uh, yeah what happens later in life is going to be very relevant especially with uh, early interventions. Thank you so much. So I'm going to try to wrap up, but but Ricardo stole my thunder, so <laughs> <laughs> not much to say except for in the lining. I think there's kind of perhaps three takeaways. One is the importance of these long-term follow-ups. And I hope we can do much more now that we have so many things going on, we can look at long-term data. The second is, is kind of to broaden out. What are these other outcomes? Uh, education is not just uh, to have success in the labor market. It is more than that. And can we measure more of that? That, that would be great. But I think that the, the third takeaway is and I think these papers provide really good, um, good examples of the big question remains this why. Why do we observe these relationships uh, between early outcomes and later outcomes or early skills and later outcomes and, and uh, later outcomes being both education and labor as well as citizenship and, and, and much broader. Um, so the why is, uh, th there's so much to do. And I think our, our conceptual thinking about capacity formation uh, will be really challenged by just empirical testing uh, of, of these relationships. So I want to especially thank uh, the younger cohort here, I'm looking through my glasses now, uh, of really uh, presenting wonderful work and uh, giving us lots of confidence of where this field is going. So thank you very much. And now it's time for tea.